Well, once more, folks, good Sunday morning to you. This time, welcome to our Bible class. I am so glad that you are joining us this morning as we continue our look at heaven and the afterlife. And you're driving this, remember. And now, if you happen to be tuning in for the first time, what I mean by you're driving this is I have asked for questions. Any questions that you might have, might have on heaven or our eternal home, or anything about the afterlife in general, feel free to send it in and we'll open the scriptures together, take a look and see what insight we can glean from the Holy Spirit uh, in terms of those questions. Well, with that in mind, we got a lot of great questions that you've sent in. Thank you so much for doing that. And so why don't we get started? One is uh, that I got on Thursday is, will we interact with angels in paradise? Now, I think I might have touched on this Wednesday, but let me do that again. On Wednesday, one of the questions I dealt with is, do I equate paradise in Scripture with the present heaven? Now, let me remind you what I mean by the present heaven. It's a term I use. A lot of people use it to describe where we go after we die and where we will remain until Jesus comes back and our bodies are resurrected. And then judgment day is ushered in. I call it the present heaven. A lot of people call it the present heaven. Again, for lack of a better term, it's to uh, distinguish it where we go immediately after we die from our final state. What what I'm saying when I call it the present heaven is it's not going to be our final state. Our final state uh, will be unveiled after the day of judgment. And and so the present heaven. call it the present heaven because... Uh, God is presenting Himself there. It's one of the ways that the New Testament uses the term heaven. It's a place in the somewhere in the invisible sphere of creation where angels live. We're told they live in heaven, they descend from heaven, they ascend back into heaven. We're told that they always behold the face of the Father who is in heaven, Matthew 18 and verse 10. And so the Father's presenting Himself there in a visible form to the angelic wor- uh, realm uh, or to the angelic world. And we're also told that Jesus came from heaven, that He ascended back into heaven, that He's sitting at the right hand of God who is in heaven. And so if we then go to be with Jesus when we die, and we do, then uh, that's where we go. I think that's the clear implication. And so the question was asked, do I believe that paradise is the same thing as the present heaven? And I said, I do. Uh, We looked at a couple of passages, the only one I'll mention again, uh, that we looked at on Wednesday was 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 through 4, where Paul talks about a visionary experience he had. Verse 2, he said he was caught up into the third heaven. We discussed that a little bit Wednesday night. And then in verse 4, he said, and I think he's paralleling this idea in verse 2 that he was caught up into the third heaven. He says in verse 4, I was caught up into paradise. Same word there used by Jesus in Luke 23 and verse 43 when he told the thief on the cross, Today you will be with me in paradise. So I do equate paradise uh, with the present heaven. So if you want to use that term paradise instead of the present heaven, that's great. Uh, And and you might want to do that because you can say, well, paradise is a biblical term. This present heaven is not a biblical term. And I get that. I'm good with that. That's fine. Let me say something real quick uh, about me occasionally using the term our present heaven. Uh, even though it's not a biblical term, that's okay. It's a biblical concept. We can use biblical con- we can cr- use terms and and create terms, if you will, to express biblical concepts. Uh, for instance, the word Trinity. Uh, we use the word Trinity to describe the nature of God, even though the word Trinity is not in in the Bible. The reason we use that is God has revealed Himself uh, as a triune God. That is, God is Father, Son, and Spirit. There is one God, but He is Father, Son, and Spirit. That's why when we make disciples in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, we're told to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. At the moment of our baptism, we enter into a relationship with God who is Father, Son, and Spirit. The Father is equal in nature to the Son and the Spirit, yet He is distinct from the Son and the Spirit. The Son is equal in nature to the Father and the Spirit, yet He is distinct from the Father and the Spirit. And the Spirit is equal in nature to the Father and the Son, yet He is distinct from the Father and the Son. One God, three distinct persons. God is a triune God. His nature is complex. It is not simple. And so for centuries, people have used the term uh, to, uh, Trinity to describe the nature of God as a triune God. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. Even though the word Trinity is not used in Scripture, the concept is. And so uh, I, I use the term a lot. Uh, not always, but a lot. Our present heaven 
to describe the place where we go uh, immediately when we die and remain until Jesus comes back because it's distinct from our final home, which we'll receive after the day of judgment. So the question is this, will we interact with angels in paradise? And the answer is, I I don't really know. Uh, As far as our present heaven goes, or paradise, I'm going to use those terms interchangeably, the Bible just doesn't give us a lot of information. I think this is what I said Wednesday night. Uh, The Bible doesn't give us a lot of information on the geography of our present heaven, of paradise. And so... Uh, we might interact with angels in paradise. If so, I'm not sure how that would be, uh, how that would work. I don't have a clue. The Bible just doesn't give us information on that. Some have suggested that they think it might be more likely that we, uh, in the present throne room heaven or in paradise, uh, we are in uh, adjacent space, that the angels who live there are in, in one space of the present throne room heaven in that invisible sphere of creation. And we, as disembodied spirits of God's redeemed holy people, we might be in another space in the present throne room heaven. But we really don't know. So will we interact with angels in paradise? I just don't know. Uh, But I will tell you this, in terms of our final heaven, our final state, after the day of judgment, when we receive the long-promised new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells, 2 Peter chapter 3.13. And as I said in our Sunday morning sermon a week ago, that I absolutely take that to be straightforward language. I think uh, it's describing what Paul describes in Romans chapter 8 and verse 21 when he says uh, the creation itself will ultimately be set free from its bondage to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. By the way, let me say this real quick. Someone asked a question about that. Uh, They mentioned uh, their view uh, historically of Romans 8.21, where Paul says that. They've taken that to mean that the creation uh, will be set free from its corruption uh, uh, because it's going to be destroyed. It's going to be annihilated. And so... But look at that closely. I don't think that's what it's saying. You know, in verse 23 when it says, we're eagerly waiting for our redemption, uh, our our adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. It's that same uh, idea that's expressed back in verses 19 through 21 about creation. It's waiting eagerly. Now, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to me that the, the, the creation cannot wait to be annihilated. That, he's, that the creation is eager to be destroyed and returned to non-existence. Uh, that just seems to be really odd. But what clinches it that Paul's not talking about that is the fact that in verse 21, if you look at that, he says the creation will be set free from its slavery of corruption, its bondage to corruption, some translations say, uh, not by returning to non-existence by being annihilated eternally. But it's going to be set free from its bondage to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. It's going to be delivered uh, as we're delivered. It parallel, Paul parallels the delivery of creation to our own delivery uh, from corruption. And we're not going to be delivered from corruption by being annihilated and being spoken into non-existence. We're going to be delivered from corruption by having sin purged from us. And so that's what Paul says about the creation. And so I really do believe that the nature of our eternal home is going to be uh, much like our original home. God is going to be glorified in the visible sphere of His creation. It's going to be a perfect world and we are going to be perfect people. And as God designed it from the very beginning, we are going to rule over this perfect world uh, to His glory while He lives among us. And so this goes back to that question, will we interact with angels in paradise? Again, I said I don't know about paradise, but let's talk about our final heaven, the new heavens and the new earth. And I don't think that we will be rubbing shoulders with angels in our final heaven. Even if we do in the present heaven, in paradise, if there in some sense we rub shoulders with angels, I don't think that's going to happen 
in the, uh, in the final, in our final eternal home. I believe that God created angels for the invisible spirit realm. And uh, He created us for the visible material realm. He created angels for the invisible sphere of creation. He created human beings for the visible sphere of creation. Angels will always be a part of the invisible sphere of creation. And we will always be a part of the visible sphere of creation, at least eternally. We will be a part of the invisible spirit realm realm of creation uh, when we die until Jesus comes back and we get our bodies back. So I don't think we're going to rub shoulders with angels in our final state, but we might in our intermediate state, but at the end of the day, I just really don't know. Okay, here's a question that someone asked. This is a very common question, and it won't take us uh, a long time to deal with, and that is, will we know each other? in heaven? And the answer is absolutely. Um, Turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 12. We will definitely know each other in heaven. A couple of verses that come to mind that uh, give us insight into that is David in 2 Samuel chapter 12 uh, when David committed his sin with Bathsheba and God said there's going to be consequences of that. One of those consequences is that you're going to lose the child. David grieved and grieved and lay on the ground and he prayed and prayed and prayed and he fasted and he was begging God to be gracious and spare the child. Uh, God did not grant that request. And so after the child died uh, and David got word that the child died, he got up, he, he cleaned up, he ate, he went to the house of God, the temple, and he worshipped and, and his servants were kind of troubled at this reaction, and they asked him about that, verse 21 of chapter 12. What is this thing that you've done? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, and when the child died, you arose and ate food. And David said, look at verse 22, while the child was still alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, who knows? Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live, but now that he has died, why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Now, let me remind you, I don't believe for one second that when David said, I will go to him, but he will not return to me, uh, that that is not a gut feel of David. It is not an emotional wish and that he's just saying that to make himself uh, feel better. Keep in mind that David had a very special relationship with God. Uh, We could spend the rest of our time together talking about that and looking at how David is called a man of God. He had a special relationship with God. He is making a statement here of divine truth. This is revelation from God. God has uh, sustained him with this revealed truth, and he's drawing strength from it, and we can draw strength from it as well. And so David definitely sees the future where uh, he is going to be reunited and the relationship with his son that he was unable to have here, uh, he will have that uh, relationship in the afterlife. I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Another passage, of course, is 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Turn over there real quick, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, I'm going to mention this passage on this question, but I'm going to come back to it. Uh, Hopefully we'll have time. We might not today. If we don't, we will for Wednesday's Bible study because another question was asked about 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, a really good one. And so we're going to come back to that. But for now, I I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 where Jesus says uh, in verse 17, uh, and remember what is going on here is he is talking to the church of Thessalonica. They have some real concerns. He's trying to put those uh, concerns, uh, he's going to try to put them at ease, bring them some comfort. And as he winds up what he's saying, he says, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Now, the reason Paul gives this revelation is the church of Thessalonica they are really concerned about their brothers and sisters uh, whom they've buried. 
and they have two things that are really nagging at them. Uh, are our brothers and sisters who died, are they going to miss out on the blessings of the second coming? And will we ever see them again? And what Paul does here beginning in verse 13 through verse 18 is he's answering those questions. Look how it starts, verse 13. We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. See, that's what's on their mind. Their mind isn't so much where we go, you know, what's it going to be like, that they are concerned about those who are asleep. Uh, that is, and again, that's a euphemism for death. Uh, so that you will not grieve as to the rest who have no, as do the rest who have no hope. Uh, so, Paul, tell us about our brothers and sisters in Christ, our friends who we've buried. Are they going to miss out on the wonderful blessings that Jesus is going to bring back? Are we going to ever see them again? And Paul's point then is really two prong. No, they're not going to miss out on anything. And that's when he says in the next verse, if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, God's going to bring with Him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. They're with Jesus now. When He comes back, they're coming with Him. And then verse 16, when God descends uh, with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17, then we who are alive, those who are alive when Jesus comes back, and remain will be called up with them, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and we will always be with the Lord. Oh, no, we're going to be reunited. They're going to be raised. We're going to join them as they go up, They're, as their bodies are going to be raised and transformed, and, and we are going to join them. And together, we are going to meet Jesus in the air. And from that point on, we will always be together with Jesus. So uh, again, the point that Paul's trying to make here is twofold. Uh, they're not going to miss out on anything. And yes, uh, you're going to be together with them eventually. And so the clear implication then is that relationship will continue. Paul could have easily said, uh, well, you don't even have to worry about that because no relationships that we formed on earth are going to be continued in the afterlife. Everything is going to be a blank slate. Uh, that's not how it's going to be. We are going to have memory, good memories. Uh, memories of our fellowship with Christ, memories of our fellowship with one another and our relationships with one another. One another. And we'll just grow those relationships that began here. We will grow them in our eternal home. Uh, one more passage, of course, is Luke 16. Uh, we can't help but to keep going back to Luke 16, the story of the rich man Lazarus, because we do get uh, quite a bit of insight here into uh, what happens immediately after we die. And notice this. Notice that there was a relationship that existed between Lazarus and the rich man even before they both died. Look at verse 19. There was a rich man. He habitually dressed in purple, fine linen, and joyous, uh, joyously living in splendor every day. And a poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs that were falling from the rich man's table and even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Uh, the rich man knew who Lazarus was. He was always there. He knew he was this poor man. Um, there was, there, you know, the, the closeness of the relationship. Obviously, it, it probably wasn't a real, real intimate relationship, uh, but he was aware of Lazarus. And there's a real possibility, uh, by the way that this reads, is that the rich man would even respond in pity, maybe at times, and uh, and give uh, uh, Lazarus a, a morsel. Uh, he would uh, show some pity and some mercy. Uh, uh, that's why he would, would come all the time. It says uh, he was laid at his gate. Um, there and he longed to be fed with crumbs and and so it seemed to be that this was a, a a regular place where Lazarus was brought and and that might again imply that uh, he did receive some measure of meager mercy there and then the poor man dies was carried away by angels to Abraham's bosom we talked about that Wednesday night as a place where the righteous go paradise uh, home with the Lord under the altar Revelation chapter six we took a look at that. And Abraham's bosom is another expression. I think all these describe the same thing. 
Uh, and the rich man died, verse 22, was also buried in Hades. He lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away. He recognized Abraham and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus so that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. He recognized him. So I think these are three passages that clearly show that we our memories are not going to be wiped clean and, and we're going to start all over in the eternal state, or even in the intermediate state, the present heaven, that we will retain memory. Uh, at, and for those of us who belong to God, uh, we will retain uh, only good memories. Uh, Jesus makes it crystal clear in Revelation that um, that all things, you know, there will be no grief, there will be no mourning, no crying, no pain. Uh, well, pain comes just as much from uh, memories as they do, you know, physical pain. Uh, emotional pain is just as real and often much more deep than physical pain. So we'll have memories and, and we will have certainly great memories of each other. Recognition, there'll be joy, there'll be happiness as we recognize each other, as we embrace each other, as we rejoice together and as we worship together and as we continue to cultivate the relationship that we started here as we continue to cultivate that, not only in the intermediate state, but in our final eternal home as well. Okay, the next question was, uh, will we work? What about jobs in our final state? Well, take a look at Hebrews chapter 3. You know, when a lot of times when people think about the final state, they think of it in terms of just rest. You know, I said Sunday morning, uh, last Sunday morning, that there's a lot of different images that are bouncing around in people's head when they think about our eternal home. And one of the most common images is, you know, I've said it many times, you know, of, of, you know, kicked back in a hammock and you're just kind of yawning away eternity. You're resting. You know, when we think about uh, the idea of rest, we kind of have those images and we're kind of in our hammock among this endless row of hammocks and we're all just kind of yawning away heaven. Or, or we're in our rocking chair and we are, you know, on this gigantic porch and there's an endless line of rocking chairs to our left and right. And it's kind of like the Cracker Barrel porch and we are just resting. Or your own porch. You may have rocking chairs on your porch. Well, where does that idea of rest come from? Well, it comes from Scripture. Hebrews chapter 3, take a look at chapter 3, look down at verse 18. We're going to read a few verses here. Listen for the word rest, or if you're reading along, and I hope that you are, look for the word rest. And to whom, this is again three, Hebrews 3, 18, And to whom did he, that is God, swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Therefore let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest... Any one of you may seem to have come short of it. Uh, for indeed, we have had good news preached to us, just as also they also, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not uh, united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest, just as it has said, he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them to enter because of, of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David after so long a time just has been said before, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. Rest, 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 rest. And then, of course, turn to Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14, and when you get there, look at verse 13. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13. 
And I heard a voice from, the he from heaven saying, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. Okay, so where does this imagery of rest come from? Well, it comes from Scripture. And so hence the rocking chairs and the hammocks and any other visions or images of rest that may pop into your head from time to time. Well, let's talk about this then. Is that what it's going to be? Are we just going to basically yawn away eternity with no activity? Or if any activity, maybe just worship, something like that. And the answer is that's not what it means when it says rest. Rest does not mean freedom from activity or freedom from work. Now think about what we just read in Hebrews chapter 18, or Hebrews chapter 3, beginning rather in verse 18, going through chapter 4 and verse 11. Remember what we just read. God parallels uh, our final home with what He gave to the children of Israel. As He brought them into the promised land, uh, He was foreshadowing what He's going to do for us. He was delivering His people to the land of milk and honey, uh, and he was going to bless them and keep them secure and safe if they would obey him. Uh, and then he parallels that with our Sabbath rest that still remains. But think about the children of Israel who entered into the promised land. Was part of that promise when you get there, you will never have to work a day in your life? <laughs> well, no. Was the promise once you cross the Jordan and you enter into the promised land... Just string up your hammock, flop back, and never again raise a hand to work. Just build your rocking chairs and find a nice little place that overlooks maybe the Jordan Valley and just start rocking away. Is that what God expected of His people Israel? And the answer is no, that's not what he expected. So when he uses the term entering into rest to describe the entering, Israel entering into the promised land, he doesn't mean that Israel is going to be free from labor. Uh, they were going to be at rest from uh, mental stress and mental toil. Again, it doesn't mean that they were going to be free from activity. Well, think about Adam and Eve when we talk about uh, the the fact that our eternal home, I believe, is going to be much like our original home. Uh, think about Adam and Eve. Did, when they were in the Garden of Eden before they sinned, was their life basically you know, swinging in the hammock or rocking in the rocking chair? And the answer is no. Turn over to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Sometimes I think people believe that uh, work came about as a result of the fall. And before the fall, man didn't have to work. And that's simply not true. If you look in chapter 3, before the fall, in verse 17, then to Adam he said, because, uh, or, uh, oh, yeah, then to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which you, I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because you, in toil will you eat of it all the days of your life. Uh, both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you, and you will eat of the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. This tells us that work lost a little bit of its luster after the fall. Uh, you're going to have to really now work hard. Before the fall, Adam and Eve still had a... A, a, a full life of activity and work. God placed them in the garden and He gave them the instruction to keep the garden and to cultivate the garden. They had real responsibility. And, and as they did that, the ground would easily produce for them and bless them. But now what we read in chapter 3 is that changed after the fall. So work lost some of its luster after the fall, but uh, work was a part of the perfect pre-fall world. And so, uh, will we have jobs? And the answer is, yeah, we're going to have a meaningful work and activity. It's going to be fulfilling the toil, the mental stress, uh, the mental toil and anguish 
that is often a part of, of work, all that's going to be done away with. All of the effects of sin are going to be done away with. And so will we work? Now, what are some of those jobs going to be? I don't know. That's one of those things I can't really answer uh, specifically, and I know we have a lot of questions about that, about what the nature of life is going to be in our eternal home. And if it really is going to be uh, a redeemed uh, world where God's going to live among us like He intended to do from the very beginning, uh, you know, what's culture going to be like? What's language going to be like? What's economics going to be like? I, I don't know any of those things. <laughs> I, I literally have no clue about any of those things. And, and one of those is what, what kind of jobs will we have? I, I don't know. But again, I know that we are going to work. Uh, and it's going to be fulfilling work. It's not going to be uh, toilsome work. Hey, let me say one thing real quick. I know we're at 30 minutes and 46 seconds. Got my little counter right there. Uh, let me answer one more question before we end for our Bible class for the day. And that is, uh, the, the person who asked said, you know, I, I mentioned about being with Christ and seeing Christ. Uh, I, I read in one of our lessons last Sunday, Revelation chapter 22, that says, uh, as God is describing our final state, he, he uses the imagery of Eden again. And he talks about uh, the river that flows from the throne and how the tree of life is there. And in verse 3, no longer is there going to be any curse. And the throne of God and the Lamb is going to be there in verse 4, and we're going to see His face. And, and someone asked the question about seeing God that I thought no one has ever seen God. You say that in our, uh, in our intermediate state or our present heaven, we're going to see God. But the Bible says that no one has ever seen God. And they, the quote of 1 Timothy chapter 6, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 16, where Paul says that God is the, in verse 15, he says he's the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And then verse 15, uh, or verse 16, who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So, Dan, you say we go to heaven when we die and and we're there with Jesus and we see Jesus, but this says no one has ever seen him or can see him. And But there we saw in Re Revelation chapter 22 and verse 5 that we will see his face. So how does all this work together? Well, how it all works together, when Paul says no man has seen and no man can see uh, God in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 6 and verse 16 there, he's talking about God in his purest essence. Uh, God in His purest essence, He is uncreated spirit. He is completely different than we are. Uh, we will be spirit. Angels are spirit, but they are created spirit. That's different. God is uncreated spirit. If you are hoping to see God in His purest essence, you will never see God in His purest essence. It is impossible. Uh, he, God exists in a category all by Himself, and He will always exist in a category all by Himself. Uh, God is nothing like us. He will never be anything like us in His purest nature. We reflect His image. Uh, many of His characteristics and attributes He has made a part of who we are as His people. But we are created beings. We are, uh, we are finite. He is infinite, uncreated spirit. Now, uh, remember uh, back in Exodus chapter 33, when we think about seeing God and no man seeing God, uh, we think about this. This is a passage really by 1 Timothy chapter 6, 16 that you need to write down in your Bible. And, and that is where Moses says to God in, in verse 20, or, or verse rather, verse 18, he says, I pray you show me your glory. Now what Moses was asking for there, he was asking God to show him the fullness of his divine nature. Show me the essence of your being. Listen, God had presented Himself to Moses before. He had met with Moses. And Moses saw, I mean, think about the burning bush. He saw a theophany. Remember that term? We talked about it a couple of weeks ago on Sunday. I said, a theophany is when God presents Himself in a visible form for people to see or angels to see. And God oftentimes presented Himself in forms for people to see. But as He was showing Himself to someone or angels in a visible form... He was not showing himself 
in his purest essence because people can't see him in his purest essence. They can see him as he presents himself in a visible form. Well, Moses was saying, now, hey, show me your glory. And God says, look what God says in verse 20 of Exodus 33. But he said, you cannot see my face for no man can see me and live. That's the same thing that Paul's saying in First Thessalonians, 1 Timothy 6, 16. Um, we cannot see, we cannot know, comprehend God as He truly is in all of His majesty, in all of His uh, mystery, in His purest essence. And so angels are seeing the face of God, Matthew 18, uh, or, or uh, Matthew 18, 10. But they're seeing God in a theophany. God is presenting Himself in a permanent theophany in the invisible realm of creation, in the invisible sphere of creation. But we will see Jesus uh, when we die. We will have fellowship with Him uh, as He presents Himself to us in a visible theophany. And in our final state, He will come and dwell among us and we will see His face, not His purest essence, but He will present Himself in a permanent theophany and will always dwell among us and we will see Himself that way. And so what's this thing about no one has seen God? How does all this fit together? That's how it all fits together. We will see God uh, just as the angels do uh, as He presents Himself in a visible form to us, both in the present heaven, paradise, and our final state, the new heaven and the new earth. Okay. Thank you so much for your questions. I know this has been a 36 sec 36 minute, 28 second and counting Bible class. Thank you so very much for joining us today. Thanks again for the questions. Keep them coming if you have them. Uh, when you're finished with them, we will move on to another great topic for Bible study, but we still have a few questions that we need to answer that you've sent in. Uh, I have enjoyed being with you. I'm looking forward to being with you really soon in person. I love you. I really do miss you. Have a great rest of this day and God bless.